welcome. I'm Dulcie Johnson. I'm with the American Association of University Women in Sheboygan. And we are very pleased to co-sponsor this Great Decision series with the Mead Public Library. I've been attending some of the Great Decisions programs in Manitowoc over the last couple of years. They have 100 people at their programs. And I thought, oh, wouldn't it be great if I didn't have to drive to Manitowoc? <laughs> we can do them in Sheboygan. And um, our library director, Garrett Erickson, was on board right away. So here we are. Um, we are indebted to Jeannie Gartman, Mead librarian, who has been very helpful in putting this program together, and to the Mead Public Library Foundation for funding the programs. There are eight uh, programs in the Foreign Policy Association series. We are only going to do four of them. And depending upon the response, we hope to expand that next year to six or eight. Um, all of our professors <coughs> for this series of four programs are from the University of Wisconsin here in Sheboygan. We will take questions and after the presentation. We will take our last question at a quarter to eight because we have to be out of the building at eight o'clock. Um, there are guidebooks which you can check out at the back of the room before you leave if you'd like. They contain reference information for all of the programs in the series and the four that we're not going to do. They're all very timely topics, as you have noticed from the series that we are doing. <clears throat> so it is my pleasure tonight to introduce Dr. Elise Cohen, Assistant Professor of Political Science at UW Sheboygan and UW Manitowoc. She received her PhD in Political Science and International Relations from the University of Delaware and her BA in International Relations from the Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs at Syracuse University. Her current research focuses on global governance, refugee policy, and nativist movements in the United States and Europe. And so Dr. Cohen is going to talk to us about the future of Europe. Much. I'm really grateful to the series for having me and I'm honored to be here. It's a really great turnout, by the way, so thank you all for coming out on a warm October night. Um, I want to begin by letting you know that I definitely don't choose the title The Future of Europe. This is the Foreign Policy Association official title because I would never be so bold as to pretend I have a crystal ball and I can just tell the entire future of uh, an entire continent. So what is mine is the subtitle of the presentation. And this is really bringing my own scholarly research into bear on the broader topic. Um, so I'm gonna define some of these. So if these look like jargon, foreign language words to you right now, no worries because I will let you know what is nativism, what do we mean by populism, um, and then the really fun one, what is Euroskepticism? Um, so to begin, I just want to provide a little bit of background. We're talking about the European project as a whole when we think about what is changing in the region of Europe and how U.S. foreign policy should change or uh, how perhaps U.S. foreign policy might even affect and impact this project. Um, and this really has its roots historically in the post-World War II project of rebuilding after the war. Um, so this sort of got its start, what you now know as the European Union, got its start in the 1950s with the so-called EEC, European Economic Community. Um, this was originally six European countries that were in Western Europe and really focused on trade regarding coal and steel. So it was especially an economic union to begin with. Um, and then we saw it enlarged throughout the 1970s and 1980s. So we had more and more European countries that wanted to be part of this project of sharing trade and working together. And so this was the very origin of what is now this really impressive major international organization called the EU, the European Union. And it started in 1950s just with these original Western European countries there. 
By the time we have more of European countries wanting in on the deal, and we get to the 1990s, there's something called the Maastricht Treaty in 1993. And this is really what paves the way for what we now know as the European Union, where we will have a, not only trade cooperation, but policy cooperation, um, creating free travel without what we think of as borders and the need for border control uh, within this new community. Uh, and so that gets us to today, what we now know as a 28-member international organization called the European Union. And this is the flag of the European Union, so you may have seen this before, as kind of a symbol of Europe united. And that is the symbol of being united together as part of the, the project at its start. So this is how it looks today. We've grown from those original six Western European countries, really focused on economic cooperation, to this amazing project for creating unity and peace and stability and economic prosperity, um, as well as this idea of being able to move freely, not just goods and <coughs> trade in terms of free movement, but people in terms of immigration, for example. Um, you may notice a couple things that jump out at you, like that little white blob between France and Austria. Oh, I, I don't know blob. I should think of a nicer geometric shape name. <laughs> That's Switzerland. So Switzerland is not in yellow because um, they have had a couple referendums on whether to join the European <laughs> Union formally, and the people voted no. They have a very strong economy, and they feel like with the bilateral trade agreements they've worked out over time, that at this point they are happy just to partner in some trade <coughs> negotiations but without actually being a member of the European Union. Um, and then you may notice up in the fingers of the Northern Europe, Norway is the one in white. So that's why Sweden and Finland are part of the EU. But Norway actually is part of the European economic area. So in a lot of ways, it almost is a member already. They have absorbed a lot of the EU laws into their own Norwegian laws and they have already the sort of trade benefits that come with being part of the economic agreement. Um, but they have a history of sort of feeling dominated by their neighbors, Denmark and Sweden. So for sovereignty reasons, they haven't officially joined the European Union. There's also something just related to the free movement of people, and that's called the Schengen Zone. And so the Schengen Zone countries are now showing up to you in the sort of turquoise, I guess you call it. Um, and you see the darkest turquoise, those are the current members of the Schengen free movement of people. Um, and then you have even some Schengen in the light blue, like Norway and, and Switzerland that we were just talking about. And up there, Iceland, right, the island country. They're not members of the EU, as you may have remembered from the previous map, but they really wanted in on this free movement. And so this is sort of like the common borders uh, and then within this area, there are no internal country borders. And so you can move freely. If you are a European Union, Union citizen, you can be a resident of one of those countries in green and just travel to another without needing to worry about a visa and uh, border control, border check. You could go for work, for education, whatever family visits, and you don't have to worry about going through the entire process of like you're traveling to a foreign country. Um, then you may notice there are some in gray, like over here, oh, there we go, the UK, which has been a member of the European Union, we'll talk about it might be moving out, um, but even though it has been a member of the European Union, it opted out of the Schengen, so it does have its own border control, and you would need to indeed get a visa and go through the sort of border control process to go to the United Kingdom. Uh, well, I was going to save Q&A for the end, but uh, let's just wait, because I may answer some questions as I go, too. That happens in classes sometimes also, but we'll, we'll see. I promise I'll get to questions at the end. And then this is the Eurozone for the money. This is the currency, and these are showing you the countries in yellow here that use the Euro as their currency. So. Um, you see there are, again, some countries that opt out that are a member of the European Union, again, like the UK, right? But they don't use the euro, they use still the sterling, the British pound. Um, so there are some of those that 
it's not like you have to use the euro, right? For some, the economies, they chose to keep their own currency. They're still in the European Union. They may even be a member of the Schengen free movement of people uh, within those borders, but they can choose, you know, did they want to adopt that as their currency or not? But you see, most of those countries have adopted the euro. We have 19 of the 28 EU members that did adopt the common currency. And the idea is like a unified financial market with the exact same currency with the same rate um, so there can be planning accordingly. There's criticism of that, but then if there's an economic recession, like we saw a few years ago, each country has a very different economy, but they won't be able to tweak the response as well because they have a common currency. Um, so again, we, we might get into some more of this in the q and I'm just trying to provide some background in case the EU concept is maybe new to some people in the room. The other big part of this is why. Why even try and have this uh, shared borders with free movement of people and free movement of goods and a shared currency among some members? And we really have to again look to history and understand how dire the situation was after the Second World War. The people really felt that these uh, rival nationalist movements were a source of violence and a source of self-harm. So if there was a way to overcome extreme nationalism, um, instead of thinking of, you know, we're French and we're German and we're British, if we could all identify as one, like, well, we are those things, but also we're all European, then maybe that would help prevent war in the future. And so that's a, a really important part of the story, and I think it's easy to take that for granted because we're so far removed historically from the major world wars that it becomes easy to sort of fall back into taking for granted the idea that we don't have arms races between the European Union member countries. We don't have a nuclear proliferation crisis among European Union member countries. And so people that support the European project would say there's a reason for that. There's a reason we can sort of take that for granted because the European Union helped overcome the causes of sort of nuclear proliferation or uh, causes of invasions and conflicts between nations. There's also a, a theory that's really prevalent in international relations that a lot of people point to for why those European countries felt like this was in their best interest to join together. And that theory holds that if you can get countries cooperating on things like trade and they realize it's good for them financially to work together, keep the trade flowing, then you can prevent them from fighting and going to war. So it's this idea that there's like a spillover effect. If countries are working together and cooperating in their economies, they can also better work together and cooperate in their politics. And so that's another idea that this will foster political cooperation and help prevent war. And then when we think about you know, what it means to identify with the European Union, there's also been a project to sort of build a sense of being European as an identity on top of whatever each individual national identity is. Uh, and that's another idea that if you have common values and common identity, then those countries will be less likely to fight. They will feel less threatened by each other because they feel that they share some common values and principles. So the European Union has really tried to foster that. They focus on democracy, for example, and human rights as some of the key components. And when a country joins, they really have to work to get their own human rights laws or the way they run elections in accordance with the sort of standards that the, the European Union will set. Okay, so now let me get to kind of where my research has focused a bit more, um, the pushback to all of that. And so the first area of pushback is what we call Euroscepticism. And if you break down the words, it kind of sounds like just what it or it kind of means like just what it sounds. Um, you've got skepticism, right? So being skeptical of this European project. So Euroskeptical. So these are political actors, you know, this could be political parties, people, leaders, that feel as though the European project for unifying Europe into a broader political entity is somehow, you know, misguided. There are different versions, there's like, they call hard Euroscepticism, where they say the country should just exit the European Union. And maybe you've heard of that in recent news, right? Exit, just completely pull out. 
And then there's a soft version that, well, maybe it's too radical to completely pull out of the European Union, but from within it, we should push for all these reforms and all sorts of change. I would say that the biggest manifestation that comes into a lot of the domestic politics of the countries in the last few years is more the hard version. And so you see vivid symbols like this one of the flag with the European Union symbol and this big red X through it that no, we actually are so opposed to the European project that we don't want to be part of this shared union anymore. A lot of the countries where you see those movements have grown in power articulate them in what they call sovereignty concerns. Um, and Well, I don't know if you're watching, even our president, Donald Trump, when he gave his speech to the United Nations a couple of weeks ago in New York City, he made history because he was the first American president to use the word sovereignty a record number of times. He said it 19 times in just the one speech to the United Nations. Um, so this is not something that's unique to the European political context. It's something that we see those who study this sort of reassertion of national sovereignty happening in different parts of the world. And, and so we have it as part of our own current sort of foreign policy approach with the new administration. And these are some pro-Brexit people. So um, these were people associated with the UKIP, the UK Independence Party. And really the main platform of that political party in the UK, the British political party, was that they should leave. So a hard Euroscepticism that Great Britain should not be part of the European Union. And you can see some of those national sovereignty phrases, like we want our country back, vote to leave the European Union. The other part of Euroscepticism brings in another concept that we study in political science, which is this distaste, dislike for any, quote, elites. And so what is an elite can be varying. Um, it could be a political elite, someone who's in political office and is able to control the budget, and easy to criticize the people that control the purse strings. It could be a cultural elite, um, like a professor, right? Because um, I'm definitely not elite in any other way than that. <laughs> but in that way, in terms of knowledge, because I have these fancy degrees as anti-elites would say, uh, maybe I think I'm a know-it-all and I try and tell the government what it should do because of my uh, long uh, line of education. Um, or it could be, you know, a just wealth-based elite, someone that is very wealthy and, and has a lot of money financially. So in general though, those kind of get lumped together and we see the Euroskeptical movements articulate also like anti-elite and instead we should fight for the ordinary man and they kind of juxtapose, they, put, they contrast and put against one another the elites that are running the government or maybe you know, have a lot of education and training in something and just the commoner who may be suffering and the elites don't hear their voice. And so this brings us to the most famous example we have in the last couple of years and that is the Brexit vote. So Brexit is British exit from the European Union. Um, this is a map showing you what the breakdown of the vote looks like regionally with those voting to leave in red and those voting to remain in the European Union in blue. And you can see, um, and of course that's Ireland over there, so just the north is part of the United Kingdom, Northern Ireland, and then the gray is a, a separate sovereign country of the Republic of Ireland. Uh, so you can see the country was quite divided and this is actually breaking it down because the UK is a union of four different nations into one political sovereign. So in England, that's where we saw a majority, a little bit, voting to leave, and that one made a big difference. So 47% of those living in England uh, wanted to remain in the European Union, but 53 voted in the referendum last summer to leave the European Union. Um, and then we see, if you look at Scotland, they actually quite strongly wanted to stay in the European Union. So the Scottish part of the UK, 62% wanted to remain, a little over a third wanted to leave. The Welsh, um, we see it was really close, but uh, slightly the, the Welsh vote went 52% to leave the European Union. Um, and then Northern Ireland over there on the top of the Irish island was much more strongly in favor of staying. 56% to remain. 
So that's why when statistically, you know, you crunched it all together, it was very narrow, but it was 52% voted in the referendum last summer, 2016, to exit the European Union. And uh, Theresa May, the current prime minister, went ahead and activated that back in March. And so if all goes according to the way this would play out, the plan would be that by 2019, the UK would no longer be part of the European Union. That would be the first time someone has left rather than joined because the trend has been growing, growing, enlarging, enlarging. How did we get there? What kinds of propaganda and uh, rhetoric and campaigning did we see to push the vote that it's a good idea to leave the European Union? This was a really prevalent poster that the UKIP, again, that's that political party I mentioned that was really in favor of leaving saying we want our country back, national sovereignty. Um, and this was one of their most prominent campaign ads. Breaking point. The EU has failed us all. We must break free of the European Union and take back control of our borders. So then they have a little message, vote to leave the European Union on the 23rd of January. Um, can, by the way, can anyone tell what does this look like? Right, so this was the poster. They're not named, there's not like an arrow saying, here's who these people are, you know, this guy's name is that, or something, or here's their story, but just sort of this flood, this wave, um, a tide of migrants and refugees, you know, swarming, coming in, pouring into the borders. And those aren't my words, those are the words of the campaign rhetoric. Swarming, flooding, overwhelming. And some of the campaigns and rallies and marches became very explicitly focused on that issue of immigration and refugees. And you can see uh, some of these, they were not only burning the European Union flag, saying we're Euroskeptical, we, we don't like the European Union project, we want out, but then also specifically saying the refugees are not welcome here, and we don't want to be part of something that might pressure us to take in refugees as a part of an EU refugee sharing arrangement. Uh, and so that was actually a very prominent sentiment for why a lot of the people that supported UKIP said that they supported that party. Was they just felt so strongly about immigration and not wanting to take in the refugees from the, the crisis. This one's a really fun one, and I can go back to it during Q&A if people want to look a little more. But really, it's just showing you some nice data on how education and location really matter. And here we can see um, the London area people are the pink bubbles. Those are the voters from London. And then they're also showing you the blue are the Scottish voters. And then the green, you know, other parts of the country. But if you look at the uh, axis on the bottom there, horizontally, it's showing you the percentage of people with a college degree. And so as you move right on this, it's showing having more education. And as you move left, having less education. And then what we have with the y-axis is how many people were voting to leave. And as you move up, those are people voting to leave. And as you move down, those are people voting not to leave, but they wanted to remain. And so what we ended up finding with this one, like a lot of other similar movements that are Europe skeptical, is education is negatively, or was negatively correlated with wanting to um, leave the, the European Union. So that means, you know, people that had more college education, had more years of education, were less likely to want to leave the Union. And they were more likely to want to remain. Now the other thing that I've uh, been studying in my own research is what we call PRRs, and I'm going to define that for you. It's Populist Radical Right. So these are the political parties themselves. So I was talking to you a moment ago about the UK IP, the UK Independence Party, that they were really the one pushing the Brexit vote. And that is absolutely the kind of label that scholars put for parties like that, very nationalist, Euro-skeptical parties. Uh, but they also tap into what we're gonna call populism. And so not only are they uh, anti-elite and Euro-skeptical, but they are very anti-immigrant. And that's one thing that unites them. You can look at a PRR in Germany, and you can look at a PRR in Spain, and you can find these commonalities, which is really fascinating for researchers, that 
in very different contexts, maybe very different unemployment rates or economic contexts even, still they will have the same messages, which are really focused on being against the European project, Eurosceptical, um, and being anti-immigrant. And so what's fascinating for me, because I really look at this a lot in my own research, is how the anti-immigrant, especially today, gets conflated with an anti-Muslim sentiment. Um, because a lot of the refugees from the refugee crisis are coming from Muslim-majority countries. That ends up linking together being a foreigner, being an immigrant or a refugee, and maybe then being this religion that is viewed as threatening. Um, so this is one of the ads that was used in, in Denmark, and I'm going to just tell you the exact meaning here. Okay. So this one is saying, um, oh, here we go. Is this your Denmark? Dies Denmark. Right? Is this your Denmark? And then below, and I know it's kind of blurry too, but all the white, I'm just going to read it to you, translating from Danish. A multi-ethnic society with mass rapes crude violence, insecurity, suppression of women, and forced marriages. So is this your Denmark? And then it lists all these awful things about rape and criminals and forced marriages and oppression. And you can kind of see the picture that they've chosen is supposed to be a woman in a burqa, representing that she's Muslim and she's like very religious and wears the full um, burqa covering. And so then at the bottom it says, um, is this what you want? That's in the yellow. Do something. Be a member of the Danish People Party's, uh, the Youth for a New Future. So the Danish People Party is like the UKIP. It's one of those uh, populist, radical right parties in Europe that really focuses on we need to leave the European Union, or the, you know they're Eurosceptic, and very anti-immigrant. And that's where they found the most success is by articulating an anti-foreigner lens. This one is taking us to France. So we're going from the Danish context into France. And maybe some people were even following the French election. Um, I don't know if people noticed that uh, for the first time they actually had someone from a PRR, a populist radical right party, Marine Le Pen, uh, who came very close to winning the presidency of France. Uh, she ended up losing to Macron, but it's the first time that France had, as a major presidential contender, um, and you know, second place, uh, someone from a populist radical right party. And so this was one of her rallies a year ago. And it says no to Brussels, and it has the European Union flag. And because the EU is seated in Brussels, Belgium, that's where that no to Brussels comes in. So saying no to the European Union. And then yes to France. So reassertion of French sovereignty, right? French sovereignty first, not this international cooperative organization. Um, and they really use the symbol of Joan of Arc to try and also have this power of like Marine Le Pen is like the Joan of Arc of today and she's going to fight for us and fight for Western civilization and Christianity and, instead of Islam. And so a vote for her will be like returning who we are in our heritage. And then this one is taking us to um, a di another Danish people. And I like this because of the visual. It just says, Ask the people, right there. A referendum on the European Union now. So it's like they didn't have a referendum, but they were calling for almost a Brexit, but in the Danish context. And I like the visual because it's the hand with the EU flag on it, and it's strangling the Danish flag. So you really, it's not subtle. It's like the European Union is, is killing us. It is choking us and suffocating us. So we should have our own referendum here to exit and, and leave for Dan Denmark, for the Danish people, to leave the European Union. So I talked before on my first slide about nativism. And there are lots of definitions that kind of relate to it. And so this is one that I'm using to help you understand this concept. Um, the basic idea with nativist movements and philosophies is that the country's people should be the native group like they are the native inhabitants of that country. Um, so what this often looks like is really intense opposition to foreigners, like immigrants, or what's really interesting to me, even internal minorities. Like we have a lot of nativism in this country that's not only anti-immigrant, but geared at American Indian, you know, Native Americans, or at African Americans. 
Right, so it can be any internal minority. They don't have to be an immigrant. Um, but in some way, they're viewed as foreign. And they're viewed as a threat to the way of life of that culture and of that country. So that's the key to remember with nativism, that they are viewing some group as a cultural threat. In our context, it would be if we said this group is un-American and they're threatening the American way of life. But you know, in the British context, it would be they're threatening who we are as, as English people and our, our English customs. Um, so I have another one for you here that I'm going to translate. So this is showing us um, an FPO, another uh, populist radical right party, but this one is in Austria. And this is an ad from 2006. Is this our future? Austria says no. Austria will remain free. And then at the bottom it says, sign up and sign our petition. And so what strikes you here? What is the message here? Anyone notice what the message might be? The woman is wearing one of those burqa type things, right? Which if you don't really know about Islam, then it doesn't matter. You, just, you get the message, even though that's not correct. It's like, oh, right, she's supposed to be Muslim. And she's wearing a white and that's it. The European Union flag is her burqa. So, oh my goodness, it's so powerful. That's why I'm so glad we got a computer projecting so that I can have images. Because the images are, are worth a thousand words. It's not only the question of if we allow all these foreigners in, or even maybe they're our own natural Austrian-born citizens, but they are Muslim, which is like a foreign religion to us. Yeah, she has blue eyes, and so probably this is an actress, you know, this is someone or a model, and then they said, oh, we're going to put you in this thing and pose for the camera, and then this will be the, the Freedom Party of Austria, which is their populist radical right party. And I keep mentioning populist party and populism, and so this is what we refer to as the anti-elite kind of sentiment. Um, so the idea of populism, this philosophy, or I should say ideology, really, it's that the people, just the ordinary common people, are betrayed by, again, that can be a political elite, someone in government, an economic elite, the very wealthy, or a cultural elite, someone with a, a lot of knowledge or intellectuals, something like that. And so the populist radical right mov movements, they combine the two. They do the anti-foreigner, we have this internal group or this immigrant group that's really a threat to our way of life. And then we have these elites that work for the European Union that are not recognizing what a threat this is, and they're actually aiding the enemy to take over our society. So here's one that the UK IP ran in support of Brexit. This is one of their campaign ads. On the left is the common person, you, right? You're the commoner, you're the audience. Your daily grind, sitting on a bus, working hard, long hours, it's not fun, funds his celebrity lifestyle. And that's supposed to be a European Union official, so it's got the little EU flag above funds his celebrity lifestyle. It's very small. And then at the bottom, it, it has what's actually an exaggerated number. It's not accurate, but it says the UK pays 55 million pounds a day to the European Union, and it's Eurocrats taking bureaucrats, which Come on, nobody likes a bureaucrat. And then combining it with European Union, bureaucrats. And he's in his limousine, right? So life is easy for him as he sits back and makes these policies that destroy our country and let in all of these foreigners. And they really start taking over from the inside out. This is another one that was run for Front National for Marine Le Pen in France. And so there you have, a, you know, choose your neighborhood and vote for the front, the National Front, which was the, or is the populist radical right uh, equivalent in France. And that's it, choose your neighborhood. It's either the nice French girl with the French flag stickers or paintings on her cheeks, um, or again, it's the burqa. The burqa is ubiquitous, and in my research into these populist radical right, that was like the most common tool used in their ads across different countries and different languages was just some woman in a burqa with the eyes peeking out and nothing more. And in addition to the anti-immigrant and sort of nativist sentiment where well, these Muslims are threats, these foreigners are threats, 
We also have the economic. So combining, um, you know, here's your European Union policy at work. This is in the British case. British workers are hit hard by unlimited cheap labor. Now you may recognize this in our own country because we have similar narratives that link unwanted immigration with job competition. And so that's maybe one that's really familiar even in this room, that you've heard that. And so really what the populist radical right parties do is they combine them. They use the economic fears combined with the fear of something foreign or culturally threatening um, to mobilize people that the European Union is the root of the problem. If we leave the European Union, we can reassert who we really are and our own national sovereignty and deal with these threats and rid ourselves of these Muslims who are threatening. I'm going to maybe skip over this one just for time, because during Q&A I can always go back to things. Okay, so what are the PRRs doing politically? This is what gets really fun for me as a political scientist. Fun in quotes. Um, first of all, they are using the fact that there's been a refugee crisis for the last four years, the biggest one we've seen since World War II, and they're using it for political gains. And what's happened, one kind of cost of that is there's been a lot of confusion of the difference between what's a migrant and what's a refugee. And so in the campaign rhetoric of these populist radical right parties in Europe, they don't make any distinction, and they don't recognize the official legal definition of a refugee is someone fleeing from persecution. So this is an international human rights law. A refugee must be based on a well-founded fear of persecution. Um, it could be their political opinion, their nationality, their race, their religion, um, but something about who they are has led them to be a target of intense persecution. So they're really fleeing the country that there is, the, is their home country to survive. That's a refugee. That's very different than a migrant. A migrant is someone who chooses to move. Maybe they're looking for a better job or for reuniting with family that lives in another country. Um, or maybe it's for education, you know, they're moving to pursue a better life. And so it's voluntary, it's not something where they're actually fleeing for their survival because they fear they may be killed or harmed. Um, but what's happened in the rhetoric about this crisis and how they're flooding the country and overtaking us is that distinction has been lost. And so people that are really qualifying as refugees under international law are just viewed as like, well, you're another foreigner, you're another migrant. So for someone like me that studies refugee policy, that's a really troubling aspect of all of this. Um, the other thing is we sort of have a scapegoating of whatever crime or social ills are happening in countries, kind of trying to link it to refugees. And this was a sign where um, they actually were calling them rape refugees. And there was even some fake news that was going around of false stories of rape by gangs of refugees. And then some fact-checking websites came and said those things were not substantiated. But as you may know from social media, you know, fake news can move very quickly. It's very hard to stop. Um, so some people were also really afraid that, oh, these refugees, again, maybe not even knowing what a refugee is compared to a migrant, um, are harming our, our women or somehow contributing to crime. Um, really disconnected from people that work on the ground, that actually work with refugee resettlement programs that heavily vet a lot of those people applying for asylum. Um, and so the reality of who are the refugees is kind of lost because the populist radical right parties don't care about accurate depictions of who the people are. They care about using that fear for political gain. And the other scapegoat, aside from you know, the refugees themselves, are the European Union officials and sort of the European project as a whole. And so the EU becomes its own scapegoat. Oh, if only we weren't part of this EU, then we wouldn't have to worry about taking in these foreigners. Here's another UK IP ad. Who really runs this country? 75% of our laws are now made in Brussels. And they have the EU burning a hole through the British flag. Like Brussels and Belgium is making our laws instead of our own British lawmakers. The refugee image has also become really securitized, meaning refugees are seen not just as a cultural threat, because a lot of them may be from Muslim-majority countries, but as a national security concern um, in the wake of terrorist attacks. So if you go back to 2015 in Paris, 
we've really seen a string every few months in a different European country. Uh, maybe there will be some knife attack or uh, what, like the London Bridge attack that happened more recently or just two days ago in Marseille in France there was a, a stabbing. And in some cases there would be either ISIS claimed responsibility or the people themselves had some ISIS literature um, or sometimes maybe that wasn't even clear if it was linked to ISIS but they were Muslims and so that was part of the identity and they, they linked that. <coughs> And so that only kind of gets the cycle going further because as people fear refugees and migrants, people they think may be from the Middle East or Muslim, uh, it reinforces the sense that they are in danger and they're bringing terrorism into the country. Um, and so as part of this sort of cycle of violence, we've also seen tremendous spikes in European countries of violence against refugees and violence against people that are perceived to be Muslim. Um, there are so many, and I, just for time, I've selected a couple, but this is one after the London Bridge attack in the British context. They had this big spike in physical assaults and attacks and um, you know, hate crimes against mosques in the UK. And Germany and Austria both have seen a series of attacks, not just a few, but um, arson attacks on asylum centers where refugees are living. And so some people were setting those on fire and spray painting like Nazi swastikas. Um, and so it's like we, we kind of see this violence manifesting in different ways. Terrorist violence that uh, contributes to this fear that maybe all refugees or all Muslims are to blame. Um, and then what I call nativist violence, which is then targeting people that are viewed as foreign or culturally threatening um, with arson attacks or assaults. As we think about the future for the U.S. and Europe, it's really interesting to see what's happening with Brexit. So this was something that we saw in the immediate aftermath. The British themselves were questioning, you know, did we make the right decision? Did we rush into the boat to leave the European Union? Um, and so this was a headline grab. More than one million people just a couple weeks later wanted to change their vote when they were interviewed you know, when they did a nationwide survey, from leave to remain. This was maybe after they saw the effects in the media coverage and talked to people. Um, this one to me is maybe the most disturbing. And that, these are the Google results the day after the Brexit vote. This is what people in Britain were searching on their computers the day after they voted. Number one, what does it mean to leave the European Union? Number two, what is the European Union that I just maybe voted to exit from? Um, which countries are in the European Union? Oh, I'm supposed to go to college in another country you know, a year from now. Oh, wait, that is impacted if by we're in the European Union or not? That, can I go there for less tuition and for free travel? Um, what will happen now that we've left? And how many countries? So it really, the Google results were suggesting that a lot of people also just didn't know basic things about what they were voting on, which again maybe you can relate to in our own democracy. <laughs> That's kind of a can be a universal problem. Um, and then we also have some interesting discussion about what does this mean for the new U.S. administration, and that's uh, Trump meeting with Theresa May, because the bilateral trade agreement we would have to work out with just the British economy, right? Instead of the European Union as a whole that we've had in our transatlantic partnership. And so there are some economists saying if we just have the US, UK, there might, might even be some labor shortages in that trade agreement uh, if they, once they leave the European Union. So kind of the future of US, UK trade is also a big question mark right now. Uh, one thing's for sure, you know, regardless of Brexit, the European Union is not doing a good job regarding the refugee crisis. Um, and we call that burden sharing or responsibility sharing of taking in these people fleeing very desperate circumstances. And this is just to give you a sense of where are those refugees really being hosted. And despite all the populist radical right campaign ads and rhetoric, the majority of them overwhelmingly are hosted in the Middle East by Middle Eastern countries, not by Europe, um, definitely not by the United States. And so these are the top 10 host countries in our current refugee crisis. And so you can see uh, a lot of them, like Turkey, has over 2 million. They have 
the largest number of refugees that they're hosting, especially from the Syrian crisis. Um, Iran, Jordan, uh, we get some into South Asia and into Africa, but overwhelmingly for the Syrians, they're being hosted in the Middle East, and then when you go even broader to Afghani, Somali, Iraqi refugees, it's still the, some of the least developed countries that are actually some of the poorest countries that are least capable to take in refugees that are doing the job of taking them in. Um, and so when we compare that to, for example, Europe, it's, it really dwarfs the number that the European countries have taken in. And really, it's just Germany and Switzerland that have also done most of the resettling in Europe. Uh, the other problem is we know that the European Union has continued to grow because I showed you the first slide where you could even see from the, it started in the 50s to today, we went from 6 to 28. Um, so every few years since the 1970s, there's been a wave of more countries that joined. And that's what we call EU enlargement. More and more countries joining this European Union. But the problem is, as it spread, you might say, horizontally, vertically, in terms of the people in those countries believing what they're doing is a good thing, that job has not been done very well. So there's a lot of work to actually convince ordinary British people, ordinary Danish people, of whatever it is that this is really something that's in their interest, and kind of reminding them what was the whole European project to begin with. And so you may say the EU has failed not only in the refugee crisis response, but also to really communicate to average citizens why is it in our interest? Why are we in this European Union? And kind of the future uh, of Europe part, if we look in the crystal ball, it seems like these nationalist trends of reasserting sovereignty over collective cooperation are growing. And so these PRRs, these populist radical right parties that I've researched, they're not going anywhere. It seems like, in fact, they may be gaining a lot of ground. And I don't know if people just saw uh, in September, there was a big election in Germany, and for the first time since World War II in that country, they had a radical right party gain seats in the Bundestag. So that's really big because of Germany's history, and you know even like the aspects of Nazi imagery that they have criminalized, you know, and the fact that they now have uh, members of this. It's called the AfD, Alternative for Germany, is the translation. Um, that's just to kind of show you the election results. The two main parties in black and red have for a long time been the dominant parties, but then you can see in blue, the AFD is now like the third most major party in Germany's political system. And that's a populist radical right party, so that is really something. Uh, some of the AFD, Alternative for Germany ads, come to our similar themes that we had before. This one is saying, uh, new Germans will make our own. And the reason is because, and that's supposed to be like a white German lady, you know, who's going to bear the future youth of Germany herself, not relying on immigrants. Because some people pointed out that Germany's aging population actually is in demographic decline, so they need fresh immigration to help keep their economy growing. And so a lot of people were pointing out that economic logic, that, oh, we're actually, we need the immigration. And so it's kind of a counterpoint. It's like, well, we'll do that ourselves. The women will get to making babies, and we'll make our own German population. We don't need to rely on those foreigners coming. And that's going to give you a very similar theme that you've seen in a lot of these campaign ads. Uh, burkas, um, we prefer bikinis. And then it has, you know, the image of the bikini-clad German women. Um, again, playing on, well, the opposite of the burqa, like, this is what we want, this is who we are. And so then the imagination conjures up the image of the burqa that would alternatively be fully cloaking and oppressing those women and robbing them of their women's rights. If, again, you have to connect all the dots, the foreigners keep coming in, and they're coming from Muslim-majority countries, and Islam takes over our society. Um, why is it so remarkable that this far-right political party has come into German politics with such a force? Uh, well, the guy on the lower right, he was one of the senior leaders, and he has made statements minimalizing the Holocaust. And so to understand you know, post-World War II Germany, that's something that they really actively have you know, mea culpa, like we are taking culpability, we're 
never going to let this happen again. They have Holocaust memorials. Um, contrary to their neighbor Austria, you know, they have really fully come to grip that and embrace that. This was part of who we were, and so we're never going to let that happen again. Um, and he, then that's really remarkable, he actually said regarding uh, one of the main memorials to the Holocaust in Berlin, oh, this is like a monument of national shame. We need to get rid of these monuments and have a more positive view of our history. And so kind of minimalizing the Holocaust statements, even suggesting that they should remove the Holocaust memorials to kind of forget the negative, you know, just look at the good things Germany has done. Um, and so that is really just, again, things like that that have happened in Austria and other places, but for that to happen in Germany, people that follow German politics are just really shocked by it. Um, and, you know, we have some other comments, like the guy in the top left, he's one of the, he's like the deputy to the director of the political party. So he's the second highest ranking AFD party official in Germany. And um, he's known for making very racist remarks. So if you follow football in Germany, what we call soccer, uh, one of their best players right now is part German, part Ghanaian. And so, you know, he's darker skin. And he said about this man, Boateng, that, oh, he's good on the field, but no German people would actually want him as a neighbor. Just because of the fact that he's racially part black, you know, part African. Um, and so, you know, these are some of the people they've had at the forefront. Um, another senior leader up there, you know, she's made really anti-immigrant remarks, very anti-European Union remarks. Um, we just have quote after quote from something like 10 of the AFD leaders reminding us of what is the populist radical right party, what unites them. Um, but even getting some of that Holocaust minimalization is something new. To me, one of the most interesting things too, because sometimes people will play up the economic logic and say it's all about the job competition. People are hurting, people are worried about their employment opportunity, that's why they're anti-immigrant, or that's why they're you know, anti-being part of the European Union. Um, but what you see in the northeastern, where it's really dark, in East Germany, that is where AFD got the largest share of the votes, and that is where per capita they have resettled the fewest number of refugees. So a lot of the people that live there never even meet or see a refugee. Yet they were the ones when interviewed after the vote in the you know, sort of post-vote survey that that's like the number one reason they voted for the party was they don't want all these refugees flooding the country. But they live in a place where there's hardly any refugees. They resettled by highest um, economy, right, and most populous places. So they actually go to the wealthier, most populous parts of West Germany. And they don't resettle many in the East German parts. So it's not really about the logic, you know, it's, it's more about the anti-immigrant or nativist sentiment. Um, and then if you've been watching just this week, the news coming out of Catalonia as a movement to separate from Spain, as their own Catalonian people, there's some interesting connection that we can make back to our broader themes of tonight. Um, because this is actually from a year ago, one of the Catalonian nationalist figures said that Brexit encouraged them. Like, oh, well, if the British can leave the European Union, maybe we can leave Spain. We also want to assert our own Catalonian nationalism over being part of an integrated Spain. So some people are saying, wow, Brexit can really create a lot of instability and give a lot of nationalist successionist movements a renewed hope to break away. And then what we're seeing now is the European Union is kind of calling on the Catalonian police, you know, to um, remember that part of being in the EU is respecting human rights. Because if you're watching the coverage of the last couple of days, it's been really brutal treatment of the Catalonians that were trying to vote in the referendum for independence by the Spanish police. So the human rights question is still not resolved even in European Union member states. You know, there's a, I want to give you the alternative, because the alternative to a lot of what I've said tonight would be, there's also some research that shows Brexit made some European populations cling even more to the project, and feel even like a stronger sense of, no, we like being in the EU. And so among some populations, it boosted support for being part of the EU. Um, there's also a really fascinating article I was reading, uh, kind of an analyst from the European Union looking at all this public opinion stuff on views of Trump in the EU. 
And the reactions to Trump have, have also been very negative in Europe. And some people say that actually may unite Europe. Sort of, maybe not good for US, but for themselves to sort of reunite as we are European and these are our principles um, in opposition to the new American administration. Uh, and these were some of the headlines that came right after or quickly after Trump's election. For Europe, there's a new threat in town, the US. Uh, EU's president, the, the president of the European Union, Tusk, calls on Europe to rally against the Trump threat. Uh, specifically, he wrote a letter to all leaders of European Union countries saying our top three threats are terrorism, Russia trying to take over it and meddle in us, and the Trump presidency. And those were like the three top threats identified to Europe. Um, and I like this one because it gives us a bigger picture. This is support for President Trump in context of support for the past two presidents. And what we can see is um, they picked a couple of main Western European countries. The red is the British, the yellow is the French, the blue is the Germans, and the green is Spain. Um, so you can see we're kind of back to George W. Bush levels, which for people that study global perceptions of the US, that was sort of a low for us um, after the Iraq war. And then we, you know, we had problems during the Obama administration too, so it was definitely not perfect. In fact, some say there was already a distancing between the US and Europe even then, um, but we sort of you know, really plummeted back down to the George W. Bush levels of favorability with the new president. So that's another one to sort of watch for the, the whole question of what is the future. Um, and this was the specific question, now that Donald Trump is US president, over the next few years, relations between our country and the US will what? And this is taking all European populations they surveyed. 8% thought it could get better with President Trump. About half thought it might not change at all, stay the same. And then 37% felt that it will get worse under President Trump. So that's another one sort of for the future. What are the people there thinking? And then I promise now we can get to all of your questions. Thank you. Restrictions um, so that even like being born in Ireland, you know, you could potentially be an Irish citizen just by that alone, not blood. So, a lot of European countries have uh, blood based citizenship. So, yes, they're very liberal in that sense of accepting immigrants, but they wanted to have their own control over that process. And so, that's why those countries that are in gray, um, even though they're European Union. They still want to have more of their own policy making. Now they cannot deny any European <laughs> Union citizen. So you know, even the UK, right? It gets to make its own policies in many regards, but they can't block or ban other European Union citizens. And so that's something to keep in mind that part of the arrangement and part of why you know UK the vote to leave being pushed as anti-immigrant is that you know, they don't want to have to take any European Union citizen. Because maybe someone who's really of Tunisian origin, but they're born in Belgium, and so they are an EU citizen, could then come here and you know, work and go to school and live in our society. And, well, we don't even want the EU citizens that may be second generation or third generation if they're maybe non-white, or if they're of Middle Eastern origin, or um, especially if they're practicing Islam. That's a very quick and simple question, and maybe it's a trick of the map, but it looks like there's a small portion of Finland that is not part of this, the Schengen area. Is 
that accurate or is that just a trick of the map? Yeah, I don't know actually. I've never noticed that in the map. Um, I, I would be sure that it's accurate, but I almost wonder if it's because there's like part of Finland that's something extraterritorial, because I don't think it, the map would be wrong. But yeah, I don't know. I haven't looked at Finland recently. Excuse me, there's another area like that too in southwest uh, Lithuania and northern Poland. That's actually part of Russia. Is that what it is? Yeah, that little little territory north of Poland is part of Russia. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, I haven't I haven't looked at that one in a while, so I think bringing the mics so we can all hear the question and the answer. Yeah. Yeah. I think we're all aware right now of the Russian influence in the elections in Germany and France and probably in the Brexit. Were, as you were looking at all of this, did you notice uh, Russian influence in other, um, other European uh, controversies and, for example, Catalonia? Yeah, I don't know about Catalonia. I didn't see anything in that one, but I saw a lot about Russian influence and fears of Russian exploitation of Brexit. And I also came across something that, um, well, you know how currently we're investigating Russian influence in the US election, that some were saying a similar um, bot used on Facebook that's a Russian bot or, or Russian, some kind of Russian uh, hacking device was used to support populist <laughs> radical right rise in Germany. So there was a story about it. I didn't have a chance to really look in depth. But um, this idea that the Russians are actively trying to exploit divisions in Europe, absolutely. And scholars that study the region say that is the biggest concern over something like Brexit. Or if there's a growing rift between the US and between Europe, is that Russia's all over that. And they are waiting to pounce. And that would be great for Russia to have a, a rift between the US and Europe. because. Russia you know, does have the designs to sort of regain a foothold and be a great power in the region. So yeah, there, there are a lot of concerns of Russian exploitation of, of all, the, all the instability that could be happening in Europe. The drive for Catalonia and independence goes back centuries, as in Scotland. And um, so I mean, this is just maybe intensified, I think, or maybe precipitated, as she suggests. There's nothing new. No, no, indeed. And under Franco, if people have ever looked at the U.S. relationship with Franco, he was very brutal towards any non-Castellano Spanish, and he banned Catalonian dance and language schools, and that resentment is still very well known by the Catalonian people. So right, it's not that Brexit causes a movement for um, sovereignty and breaking away of you know, succession, but perhaps that it can give renewed hope to some movements. Like, oh, now we're going to think about how this could apply to us, take advantage of the moment, and maybe we'll break away as well, but from our own country. More question? Question. We need a question. So, have we about 10 minutes? Uh, regarding Brexit and the uh, vote to leave, is there any chance that that vote will come again before the population and go the other way? That's a great question. There have been some calls by the Labor Party, the liberal members of parliament there. It's like, uh, clearly, so many people are against it. They just did a survey over the summer that found now more people would vote to stay than to leave if they held the referendum today. Um, so some of those liberal members of parliament have called for doing it over, a redo. Um, so it's a domestic politics issue right now in the British political system because Theresa May is facing kind of a weakened position. She had um, an even lower support level in the last election they held, which she thought would show everyone that people really love Brexit and, that, and they do support uh, her party going forward with it. And so some, even within her party, are saying, maybe, Theresa May, maybe you should step down because you're linked to the Brexit vote. Um, the, whether they're actually going to redo it remains to be seen. Right now, her position is we're going to do like a soft exit, and we hope to negotiate all of these things to help our economy before we officially leave in 2019. But the issue is there's 
really no way to do it softly because part of getting to be in the free trade part with all the benefits of the economic sharing is the people sharing. And that's what really motivated the vote of people wanting to leave was more about immigration than the economy when they did post-vote surveys. So that remains a question for British domestic politics and her own party. If they force her to step down, um, would that then be used as a platform to do it over and call a new referendum? Her position has been, you know, the people have spoken. We had the referendum. It was official. We are moving on that. And so her stance is, no, we're not redoing it, and we're going to be out by 2019. You, you said that the European Union was not doing enough to help certain is, is there some way that the European Union could be made stronger or should be taking stronger steps? Yeah, for people that study European Union reform, there are so many avenues. So there's the economic problem that comes with the shared currency. How does a country then respond to inflation? How does a country um, use its own economic background? I mean, you know, Germany only has like 4% unemployment compared to like Spain or Greece where maybe it's more like almost 20%. So, you know, these are really different economic contexts and for all or many of them to have this idea of the shared economy can be problematic. So there's a lot for, we should, um, and I think people that may have done the reading in the booklet, there's a lot by uh, Dr. Moravchik because he really focuses on European economic reform. There's a lot of avenues for that. Um, in terms of the refugee burden sharing, Yes, there have been plans of here's how each country based on its wealth and population could fairly share responsibility for these desperate people fleeing, looking back to our own history of when we were desperate and, and fleeing uh, war and violence, um, and that has been rejected. It's been all talk, no action um, by the actual states viewing that they would really be committing political suicide at home if they took that many refugees in. So, yeah, there, there are a lot of great plans, and I think we just don't see the political will so far to execute them. Excuse me. Well, thank you for coming. Uh, what is your take on Angela Merkel? Uh, what type of a force do you feel she is for holding the EU together? Yes, that's a great question because Merkel in the last election, she did win um, less than her party has traditionally in Germany. So some people said, wow, that's really showing a decline in support for her. But she did still win, and that's a really important factor because she's so pro-European Union. The thing with Merkel is she does see a new potential ally because in France, the populist radical right Marie Le Pen lost and Macron came, and Macron is very pro-European Union as well. So she has the potential, now she has like a new ally in France. She can work with Macron. They both take a very pro-European Union stance and maybe weather um, her own domestic politics storm of the rise of the radical populist right in her own country. So the other, she's really linked with the European Union. The people that voted for the AFD were also very anti-Angela Merkel. Um, they link her with refugee sharing because Germany has done so much. They've really led, they've been like a model for mm -hmm. refugee responsibility sharing. Um, but right, her, her attackers use that against her and those that support her believe in those principles of kind of who we are as Germans, that's who we are. You know, we, we are taking in these desperate people and they recognize their own history. So I would say there is some maybe positive for her because Macron is there now in France and they can kind of unite. Um, and then a lot will be a question mark about Trump-Merkel relations because they were off to a very rocky start. But he did recently visit Germany and he, I don't know if people followed, but early in uh, Trump's campaign and then when he was president-elect, he said he would not support NATO's Article 5, which is um, mutual security and defense. Um, if one is attacked, like we all come for the one and fight to defend them. And he's saying, oh, I don't know if I support that. And that was really well, or I should say really uh, poorly received in the European Union because that's a staple of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. But then when he just visited Germany, he kind of backtracked and he said, oh, okay, I do recognize and accept Article 5 is important and we would continue to defend a European ally. So um, it's one, like it was off to a rocky start, German, US, but if that can improve, then maybe that will also help Merkel feel more secure. Thank you. 
I know you touched on Macron. I'm interested in what you have to say about his, his difficulties. I mean, that's what we read. What is going on? What are his problems? Yeah, so the support for Le Pen, even though I think it came to like 34% for Le Pen, the French radical right candidate, um, over his 64 or whatever percent. So he had a very strong victory over her. But there's still that third of the country then that not only wanted the opposite of Macron, but they wanted something even more extreme. They wanted maybe even pulling out of the European Union. Um, one of his biggest things, too, is he's viewed as an elite because he's also a wealthy businessman. So he's viewed as maybe part of that problem of the economic um, collapse, you know. But France has higher unemployment than Germany, so you know that's more of a concern for him uh, than for Merkel. So I would say the fact that he's viewed as an elite, the fact that they are having a slightly higher unemployment, and the fact that then he has a whole third of his country that wanted the populist radical right candidate instead of him. I think there was maybe just time for one more. Um, the president said a few weeks ago, and I think he probably changed his mind yesterday, but um, he was very concerned about the, they're not paying their fair share. And um, he stayed with a lot of different things happen, but he's still on that point about the European Union not paying their fair share. What's the position now? Yes. Yeah, so, he has it, or may change next week. Right, right, and uh, it's a great question. It, it's it, actually it's the fair share is about NATO, um, which is you know, very NATO. similar. Yes, but it's it's a very timely question. NATO. Um, so there are some false numbers where they say, oh, the U.S. contributes like seventy percent to defense spending, but that's really misleading because that's saying defense spending all over the world, and the U.S. has 800 military bases in the world, and a lot of stuff in Asia Pacific and the Middle East, you know, well outside of Europe. So that's a really misleading kind of fake news thing if people are saying, oh, the U.S. pays 70 percent. We don't pay 70 percent. We do pay 22 percent of the NATO budget, and we've liked it that way so that we can control the majority of the budget. I think the next one is like, um, I may have it, um, Germany pays 14% of the NATO budget, France 11%. So we're at 22%. And that gives us a sense of control. And so historically, that's why we wanted to control NATO, and we wanted to be the pullers of the purse strings, so that we can feel like our hegemony, our power, is intact, and that we dominate. Even in Europe, that like we are the regional great power of Europe, because we control the military. Also, there's a key principle in international relations regarding threat perception and this belief that countries want to judge their military might relative to other countries. So we would want to have the strongest military. And we would feel threatened if Germany started spending more on its own military or France started spending more. So it's a really interesting thing now to hear a US president say, oh, they should spend more on their military. Because all through the Cold War, and since we emerged as a, a major power, we've wanted just the opposite. We have wanted other countries to spend less, ally with us, and we'll be the ones with the big guns, and we'll be the ones that run the show. Um, so, yeah, there is something to it, but also there's a reason why it's been that way, and this would be a big departure from our history.